Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This week is Parsha number 17, Yitro, meaning Jethro, and we're starting in Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. We'll give everyone a chance to get turned there. Now Yitro, the priest of Midian, Moshe's father-in-law, heard about all that God had done for Moshe and for Israel, his people, how Adonai had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moshe had sent away his wife Zipporah and her two sons, Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, had taken them back. The name of the one son was Gershom, for Moshe had said, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. The name of the other was Eliezer, meaning my God helps, because, of, because the God of my father helped me by rescuing me from Pharaoh's sword. Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought Moshe's sons and wife to him in the desert where he was encamped at the mountain of God. He sent word to Moshe, I, your father-in-law Yitro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. Moshe went out to meet his father-in-law, prostrated himself, and kissed him. Then after inquiring of each other's welfare, they entered the tent. Moshe told his father-in-law all that Adonai had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardships they had suffered while traveling, and how Adonai had rescued them. Yitro rejoiced over all the good that Adonai had done for Israel by rescuing them from the Egyptians. Yitro said, Blessed be Adonai, who has rescued you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh, who has rescued the people from the harsh hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Adonai is greater than all other gods, because he rescued those who were treated so arrogantly. Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, and Aharon came with all the leaders of Israel to share the meal before God with Moshe's father-in-law. The following day, Moshe sat to settle disputes for the people, while the people stood around Moshe from morning till evening. When Moshe's father-in-law saw all that he was doing to the people, he said, What is this that you are doing to the people? Why do you sit there alone with all the people standing around you from morning till evening? Moshe answered his father-in-law, It's because the people come to me seeking God's guidance. Whenever they have a dispute, it comes to me. I judge between one person and another. I explain to them God's laws and teachings. Moshe's father-in-law said to him, What you are doing isn't good. You will certainly wear yourself out. And not only yourself, but these people here with you as well. It's too much for you. You can't do it alone by yourself. So listen now to what I have to say. I will give you some advice, and God will be with you. You should represent the people before God, and you should bring their cases to God. You should also teach them the laws and the teachings and show them how to live their lives and what work they should do. But you should choose from among all the people competent men who are God-fearing, honest, and incorruptible to be their leaders, in charge of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Normally they will settle the people's disputes. They should bring you the difficult cases, but ordinary matters they should decide themselves. In this way, they will make it easier for you and share the load with you. If you do this, and God is directing you to do it, you will be able to endure, and all these people too will arrive at their destination peacefully. Moshe paid attention to his father-in-law's counsel and did everything he said. Moshe chose competent men from all Israel and made them heads over the people, in charge of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. As a general rule, they settled the people's disputes, the difficult cases they brought to Moshe, but every simple matter they decided themselves. Then Moshe let his father-in-law leave, and he went off to his own country. In the third month after the people of Israel had left the land of Egypt, the same day they came to the Sinai Desert. After setting out from Rephidim and arriving at the Sinai Desert, they set up camp in the desert. There in front of the mountain, Israel set up camp. Moshe went up to God, and Adonai called to him from the mountain. Here is what you are to say to the household of Yaakov, to tell to the people of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians 
and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will pay careful attention to what I say and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you will be a kingdom of Kohanim for me, a nation set apart. These are the words you are to speak to the people of Israel. Moshe came, summoned the leaders of the people, and presented them with all these words which Adonai had ordered him to say. All the people answered as one, Everything Adonai has said we will do. Moshe reported the words of the people to Adonai. Adonai said to Moshe, See, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, so that the people will be able to hear when I speak with you, and also to trust in you forever. Moshe had told Adonai what the people had said. So Adonai said to Moshe, Go to the people. Today and tomorrow separate them for me by having them wash their clothing and prepare for the third day. For on the third day Adonai will come down on Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. You are to set limits for the people all around and say, Be careful not to go up on the mountain or even touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. No hand is to touch him, for he must be stoned or shot by arrows. Neither animal nor human will be allowed to live. When the shofar sounds, they may go up on the mountain. Moshe went down from the mountain to the people and separated the people for God, and they washed their clothing. He said to the people, Prepare for the third day. Don't approach a woman. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud on the mountain. Then a shofar blast sounded so loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood near the base of the mountain. Mount Sinai was enveloped in smoke because Adonai descended onto it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moshe spoke, and God answered him with a voice. Adonai came down onto Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. Then God then Adonai called Moshe to the top of the mountain, and Moshe went up. Adonai said to Moshe, Go down and warn the people not to force their way through to Adonai to see him. If they do, many of them will perish. Even the Kohanim who are allowed to approach Adonai must keep themselves holy, otherwise Adonai may break out against them. Moshe said to Adonai, The people can't come up to Mount Sinai because you ordered us to set limits around the mountain and separate it. But Adonai answered him, Go, get down, then come back up, you and Aharon with you. But don't let the Kohanim and the people force their way through to come up to Adonai, or he will break out against them. So Moshe went down to the people and told them. Then God said all these words, I am Adonai your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. You are to have no other gods before me, you are not to make for yourselves a carved image or any kind of representation of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the water below the shoreline. You are not to bow down to them or serve them, for I, Adonai, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but displaying grace to the thousandth generation of those who love me and obey my mitzvot. You are not to use lightly the name of Adonai your God, because Adonai will not leave unpunished someone who uses his name lightly. Remember the day Shabbat, to set it apart for God. You have six days to labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Shabbat for Adonai your God. On it you are not to do any kind of work, not you, your son, or your daughter, not your male or female slave, not your livestock, and not the foreigner staying with you inside the gates to your property. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day he rested. This is why Adonai blessed the day, Shabbat, and separated it for himself. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land which Adonai your God is giving you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false evidence against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female slave, 
his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the people experienced the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled. Standing at a distance, they said to Moshe, You speak with us, and we will listen, but don't let God speak with us, or we will die. Moshe answered the people, Don't be afraid, because God has come only to test you and to make you fear him, so that you won't commit sins. So the people stood at a distance, but Moshe approached the thick darkness where God was. Adonai said to Moshe, Here is what you are to say to the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen that I spoke with you from heaven. You are not to make with me gods of silver, nor are you to make gods of gold for yourselves. For me, you need make only an altar of earth. On it you will sacrifice your burnt offerings, peace offerings, sheep, goats, and cattle. In every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. If you do make me an altar of stone, you are not to build it of cut stones, for if you use a tool on it, you profane it. Likewise, you are not to use steps to go up to my altar, so that you won't be indecently uncovered. Amen. Now, as usual, so much inspiring information is given in this Torah portion, but we only have the time to focus on one or two aspects of its contents. And without doubt, the most important is chapter 20, that is best known as the Ten Commandments. You know, it's been my goal for many years to correct a terrible, an entirely intentional wrong, a harm that has done more damage to Christ followers, led more people into apostasy than any other single doctrine of man. A false, perhaps a demonic doctrine that has been perpetrated upon millions, perhaps billions of people who have sincerely sought God since around the 4th century AD. It is that the New Testament teaches that our Savior came to abolish the Old Testament Law of Moses and thus no longer do followers of Jesus have any divine rules, no regulations to obey, no obligations to carry out. In fact, in order to try to obey any part of the Law of Moses, is considered a sin because it means we're trying to obey a set of faulty rules that God only found out later He made in error. Now, countless times I have taken readers and hearers to Matthew 5 17 through 20, something that was part of the Sermon on the Mount, in which Yeshua says in unequivocal and forceful language. He did not come to abolish the law. Not even the tiniest part of it, and there are great consequences ahead for those who claim He did, but even worse for those who teach that He did. Now, we're going to spend an embarrassingly small amount of time to deal with what is perhaps the crux of our faith. And how critical it is to ensuring that our behavior is moral in God's eyes. So I urge you all to go to the Torah class app or to the website, Roku TV, YouTube, <laughs> any other of the many sources of Torah class lessons and study all that is said in them about Exodus chapter 20. And I want to tell you right now is largely taken from those studies. Now, the first thing to address may sound like it is but parsing words. It's anything but that. So I'll begin this way. The Ten Commandments of Exodus 20 needs to be mentally pictured as the God worshippers constitution. A 
constitution is not a law code. Rather, a constitution sets down the basic principles and the underlying criteria for how and why a nation is established. What is going to make it separate from all others? It prepares the way for a law system to be created. And thus, the newly created law system must be bound to and faithful to that constitution. I'm going to say it another way. Every law, every command and rule that will come as a result of the constitution will be nothing more than case examples of how each and every principle of that constitution is to be carried out in practice. In Exodus 20, it lays out ten exacting principles for God's chosen people and all who would be joined to His people. This leads me to the second important fact that will reorient what those Ten Commandments actually are. Let's begin with the first verse of chapter 20, where it says in most Bibles, and or then God spoke all these words, saying. Now, the word to focus on is near the end of that verse, and the word is word. The word, W O R D, word. This is the term that God uses when referring to that which the Constantinian Church, formed in the 300s AD, now calls the Ten Commandments. See, yet you will notice that nowhere in chapter 20 did we see God give the title, the Ten Commandments, to what is spoken to Moses on Mount Sinai. And since the title, the Ten Commandments, doesn't appear here, then it is actually a doctrine rather than a literal scriptural interpretation. That is, like the regularly used church terms eternal security, or rapture, or trinity, or even the tribulation. These are all man made doctrines that consist of titles and names that do not appear in Scripture. Instead, they are interpretations. They are the fulfillment of agendas that are derived from ideas contained within the Scriptures, but each with a purpose of creating a certain image of truth according to one denomination or another. Let's look in the original Hebrew at what the word word as we find it in Exodus 20, verse 1, means. Because Word is what God calls what has been traditionally labeled as the commandments. Even the formal academic name for it, Decalogue in Greek, means ten words, not ten commandments. The Greek academic term is correct. It is the correct meaning, how, but, but it, the church at large, well, it, the church has been taught something intentionally skewed. In Hebrew, what is properly translated to English as word is debar. Debar means speech. It means communicating a thought to someone else usually through audible speech. Debar is an utterance. It's a word in a sentence, just as we typically think of it. It is speaking or writing, perhaps, in a known language. Nothing about this term, however, indicates that it is a command. Debar is rather neutral, it's a general term. That is, debar does not characterize the nature or the content of the words. The words could be about 
anything. What matters most about what is said in Exodus 20 is that these words come directly from God. And therefore, their weight is massive and their truth inviolable. So, what is being communicated to us in this first verse of chapter 20 is that Moses did not receive the Decalogue through divine inspiration. Rather, God appeared. God actually spoke these words audibly in a manner that human ears could hear, human minds could process it. God gave these words by means of an oracle, a divine voice, not by inspiration. Most of Holy Scripture is accomplished indeed through intangible divine inspiration. That is, the Holy Spirit moves a man supernaturally, somehow, in conjunction with that man's own mind and thoughts, to write down that which is true and absolute, and it reflects Jehovah's mind and thoughts. It is what God wants humanity to know about Him and His plans and His creation. Here, however, in Exodus 20, it was not divine inspiration upon a man that was recorded for us. Rather, it was God speaking out loud to Moses and to Israel in a terrifyingly audible voice. And what is recorded in the Holy Scripture is said to be the actual and precise words that God spoke. Jehovah wanted those principles by which Israel was to be formed, the morality they were to abide in, to be made so very clear for all time that not only did God Himself audibly speak these words, but later with his own finger, figuratively speaking, did he also carve those same principles into words, into stone tablets, that they preserve, be preserved throughout the history of mankind. Man had nothing to do with this at any stage. And again, this is totally unlike most of what is written in the Bible which is a peculiar collaboration between God and man that for lack of any other way to describe the indescribable, we call it inspired. Now, as to the dubious title that Christianity traditionally gives that which follows verse 1, the Ten Commandments, not until later on in Exodus chapter 34, Verse 28 is the speech of God to Israel. It's in verses 2 through 14 of Exodus 20. Not until then is it actually given a formal title. And this formal title is in Hebrew, Eser Debar. Indeed, Eser is an archaic biblical Hebrew word used for the number 10. But what did we just learn Debar meant? It's an utterance. It's a speech. That is, where Exodus 34, 28, and most of our Bibles says the Ten Commandments, the literal translation, which agrees with Exodus 20, is the Ten Words. So as we move on, we need to establish that the central content of Exodus 20 is the Ten Words, not the Ten Commandments. Now, we further need to understand its nature as the set of principles that forms a constitution of sorts, that the several hundred laws and commands that will immediately follow, beginning in chapter 21, best known as the Law of Moses, it's all going to be based upon that. I mean, let's shoot some more holes through some long-held but erroneous Christian doctrine about those ten words. What's always been taught 
in the church as the first commandment is not the original first commandment. The original first commandment, first word, is I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. The you shall have no other gods before me. Well, that's the original second commandment. Yet even more correctly, in the original Hebrew, which by the way was verified by the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the first commandment reads, I am Jehovah your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. That's right, where just about every Bible ever made says, I am the Lord your God. The original Hebrew is literally translated, I am Jehovah your Elohim. It uses both God's personal name and his position of authority as Elohim. Now, this verse establishes which God <laughs> and the world's enormous pantheon of gods that it was who rescued Israel from the slavery of Egypt, led them through the desert wilderness, and gave them a land of their own. It establishes which God's code of morality was given to Israel to live by? There could have been no more important first statement in Israel's constitution than that. That is, which God it was, under whose authority was it, that Israel should become its own nation, to have its own national territory. Essentially, and especially, since that national territory was already taken and occupied by a people called the Canaanites. The reality is that the original first commandment has always been deleted from the Christian version of the Ten Commandments. Why? Why? Well, because the Constantinian church saw Jehovah as the God of the Jews, replaced by Jesus, the God of the Gentiles. So while they certainly wish to retain the Ten Commandments to use as a basis for their doctrine, the church also did not want to retain Jehovah as God. Please understand that in the end, the main reason we should include, I am Jehovah your God, actually your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery, is as a so-called commandment, a word, it's always been there <laughs> as the original Holy Scripture, the first of the ten. It is even assigned the number one, Aleph, in the original Hebrew. Modern Hebrew scholarship is unanimous in this. Now, I want to move on to what is perhaps the most important and yet controversial of those ten words, the Sabbath commandment. The fourth word begins with, remember the day Shabbat to set it apart for God. Now, Dr. Samuel Bacciochi says this in his book, From Sabbath to Sunday, and it's a historical investigation of the rise of Sunday observance in early Christianity, and he says this, and I quote, The investigation establishes that the change from Saturday to Sunday occurred about a century after the death of Christ in the Church of Rome as a result of an interplay of Jewish, pagan, and Christian factors. The result of the change of the day of rest and worship was not merely a change of names or of numbers, but rather a change of meaning, of authority, and of experience, a change from a holy day to a holiday. A change from a holy day into a holiday. And we all know the difference between a holy day and a holiday. The Constantinian Church, the Church as it exists today and as it has since the 300s AD, dismantled the meaning of the fourth commandment, the fourth word, 
changed it to something that had never in history been practiced before. And thus it ended it as being a God ordained holy day. The fourth word explains that the divinely established Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And it tells us how we are to view and to observe the Sabbath. Shabbat is Hebrew. And then this fourth word ends with this. This is why Yehovah blessed the day Shabbat and he separated it for you. What does it say? For himself. Unless one has come to the conclusion that believers have the right to ignore the fourth commandment, the fourth word, about observing the Sabbath, and that Gentile Christians should only have nine commandments, not ten, then I guess it's important to know when and what the Sabbath is in God's view. One of the regular points of disagreement concerning the Sabbath is when the Sabbath occurs. I think I can safely say there are seven days in every week. Disagreement. Okay, I don't see any. And there's just one seventh day of a week. Every week without fail. Just as there's only one first day, one second day, one third day, you get the idea. All throughout history. Throughout written history, even before official calendars, there has been a unit of time measurement called a week. This consisted of seven consecutive sunsets and sunrises. At first, days were simply numbered first day, second day, third day, so on. The Hebrews to this day continue to use that numbering rather than naming system of days except for the seventh day, which is given the name Shabbat because that's what God called it. Now, while calendars can and do differ over the thousands of years since they were first invented, amazingly, there is no disagreement over how many days there are in a week. And there is but only one or two rare instances in which the first day or the last day of the week are moved. One such exceptional calendar is called the runic calendar, invented and used only in the region of Sweden in about the 13th century AD, and it was created in order to take into account the Nordic god and goddess system. All calendars from every region of the world have been in tune when it comes to the beginning and ending of weeks. Now, one new exception is a modern standard that is initiated by the International Organization of Standardization. This is a group that was formed a few decades ago to develop international business and manufacturing standards. If you're in manufacturing, you've heard of the various ISO standards. Now, they've decided that for business, record keeping purposes. Monday's the first day of the week. The reason for their change is interesting. Because the Jewish Saturday Sabbath and the Christian Sunday Lord's Day together form what we call a weekend, and usually are non-work days in the industrialized world, then the ISO decided it was logical for business purposes to make the first work day of the week. Monday and their new standard for the first day of the week. Now, the point is this whatever issues have arisen over the centuries concerning the proper day for Sabbath observance, it certainly has nothing to do with identifying which day of the week is the seventh day. Now, God says in Genesis that all was created in six days, and on the seventh, He, the Creator, rested. And he also there ordered that the seventh day was to be called Sabbath, Shabbat, 
and set the day aside to be observed as holy. So to assemble on Sundays, as is traditional for the Gentile Christian church, which is the first day of a new week, obviously is not observing the commanded seventh day biblical Sabbath, is it? Instead, Christians observe a rule that was enacted by the bishops of the newly formed Roman Church, a Gentiles only faith, Jews excluded, that a day of fellowship was to be on Sunday and it would be called the Lord's Day. But the Sabbath, well, that was abolished. The Lord's Day, Sunday worship, was created in honor of Christ's resurrection on the first day of the week. However, the Lord's Day is simply not the Sabbath, as defined by Jehovah in the Bible. And the Sunday Lord's Day was never designed to be that. So this brings me to an important question which all of us must answer and be accountable for, by the way. Do you believe? Do you believe? You are to follow all of the Ten Commandments, or just certain ones of them. Don't answer that too quick. Certainly not out loud. The Constantinian Church has, since its inception, openly admitted it does not observe the Fourth Commandment, even though very often, their congregation members don't even realize it. Often the church responds to this glaring contradiction of how Christians can insist on the one hand that they believe in the validity of all the Ten Commandments, heck, usually having the Ten Commandments proudly displayed in their homes and on their church walls. But on the other hand, Technically, they don't observe the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. Now, some will equivocate and declare that with the advent of Jesus, Sabbath can be any day we choose. And it's optional if we wish to observe one at all. So if we choose to coincide our own chosen personal Sabbath day with the Lord's Day, Sunday, well, all the better. The problem is that this philosophy makes the Sabbath our Sabbath, doesn't it? Our Sabbath. It abolishes it as a holy day and instead makes it but a man made holiday. Nowhere does the Bible declare anything but that the Sabbath is the Lord's Sabbath, and that it is only the seventh, the last day of each week. The Sabbath indeed may be for our benefit, but it was ordained by God. It was defined by Him. It belongs to Him. And as Dr. Bacciochi points out, when the new Constantinian church in Rome was established, it claimed no scriptural authority or basis for changing the Sabbath. Let that sink in. Rather, they determined that the Sabbath was to be abolished purely because, and this is stated, because it was a day observed by Jews. And as explicitly stated in the records of that fateful series of church meetings called the Councils of Nicaea and Laodicea, Sunday was chosen as a day of communal worship throughout the Roman Empire because it was mostly a political accommodation. It was already a day of meeting and worship for the largest, the most influential religious group in the Roman Empire, the Mithraeans, sun worshippers, 
who had already named the first day of the week after their deity, the sun god. Hence the name, Sunday. Where do you think it came from? Later, with the evolution of the Roman Church to the Catholic Church, the bishops declared they have the authority to abolish the Sabbath because the Pope has the authority from God to do anything he decides is best, including amending Scripture. But for Protestants who do not acknowledge the Catholic Pope's authority to do such a thing, well, that requires a different route, doesn't it? The idea that Protestant individuals can choose to honor the Sabbath or not, and if they can decide, to, it can be any day they choose, is based on nothing but a man-made doctrine that they have adhered to for 16 centuries that basically says, if the Jews do something, Christians should not. Now, I'd like to offer one more observation to end this Torah portion. It's this. When Yeshua was asked which were the most important commandments, he said this in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40. So it starts out this way. Now, Rabbi, which of the mitzvot, which of the commands of the Torah is the most important? And he told them, you are to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and this is the greatest. It's the most important mitzvah. Second is similar to it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. All of the Torah and the prophets are dependent on these two mitzvot, these two commands. Please note, Yeshua didn't say that obeying these two commands replaced the Torah. Only that the Torah, here meaning the Law of Moses, was dependent upon them. See, that is, just as a house is dependent on the foundation that it sits upon for stability. So in the same way, we can think of the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, as a constitution. So then we can also view the commands to love God and love our fellow man as the stable bedrock foundation upon, upon which rests those ten words. And then we should view those ten words as themselves the framework upon which all the Law of Moses rests. See, once we can see the structure it makes it all the easier to understand why it is supremely illogical to think that God would give us the Ten Words and then the Law of Moses, but upon His Son's advent, He yanks some of, all of it out, out from underneath us. Love was always the center of God's principles for human conduct and for our relationship with Him. But it was not a love without definition or boundaries. Not a love that replaces obedience. It is the law of Moses where the definition of love and of love's boundaries are established. Never will this change until the heavens and the earth pass away. For more teaching and information, visit us online today. Come and be a part of our fellowship. Here at The Seed, enjoy worshiping and learning God's Word with us.